Production and creation are the same thing after all. The contents of this video are suitable for adults only. It contains graphic material. Here, buried in this cemetery in Brisbane, are the remains of a man that some people believe conducted his own late 19th century reign of terror in Dickensian London. But could that be the case? That Jack the Ripper is buried in an Australian cemetery? Or is the man whose remains lie here instead the Australia's greatest ever swindler and bigamist? It was a time when a cruel and calculating killer roamed the streets of East London, killing, it seems, at will. He became known as Jack the Ripper because of the manner in which he mutilated his victims and killed an unknown number of prostitutes, even though police would maintain he was responsible for five slayings they called the Canonical Five. Despite massive involvement from the Metropolitan Police, the Ripper was never caught. The story goes that a man by the name of Andrew Gibson, apparently known to police in London, left the East End bound for Australia within hours of the last of the Whitechapel murders police believe was committed by the Ripper. Gibson was said to be on a sailing ship bound for Melbourne, almost certainly using a different name, perhaps Walter Poirot. But what was his background and could he have been Jack the Ripper? Gibson, aged between 18 and 21, lived in the suburb of Limehouse, not far from Whitechapel, which is approximately five kilometres from the centre of London. In the 1880s, Whitechapel and some other areas became known as the worst parts of London, largely Dickensian-style slums where poverty ruled in the crowded streets and prostitutes plied their trade. Dorset Street in Whitechapel was said to be the worst street in London and was once portrayed like this. It was a street of whores. It teemed with nasty characters, desperate, wicked, lecherous, razor-slashing hoodlums. There were pubs every few yards, bawdy houses every few feet. It was peopled by roaring, drunken, fighting mad killers. It was in this melting pot of disease and vice that the man who would eventually be known as Jack the Ripper found susceptible victims for his handiwork. <laughs> The first was Mary Nichols, who was found at about 3.40 in the morning in the gateway behind the man walking along the wall in the centre of this photograph. She had been attacked so viciously that as a result her head was almost severed from her body when her throat was slashed. The second was Annie Chapman, who was murdered just eight nights and a couple of kilometres from where Mary Nichols' body was found. She had been living at a lodging house in Dorset Street, but that night didn't have the tuppence to pay for it, so, despite being ill, spent the night on the streets trying to raise the money and some more. Her body was found at six o'clock in the morning in the backyard of a house in Hanbury Street. She had been horrifically mutilated and parts of her body taken away. The body of the Ripper's third victim, Elizabeth Stride, was found in what was then Burner Street, now Henrik Street, about a kilometre and a half from where Annie Chapman was found, some three weeks since the last killing. Elizabeth Stride's throat had been cut, but she'd not been interfered with in any other way, which suggested to police that the killer had been disturbed. At almost the exact time the body of Elizabeth Stride was discovered, about 1am, the next of the Whitechapel victims of the Ripper was being released from Bishopgate Police Station after being detained for being drunk and disorderly. While Catherine Eddowes was making her way towards home, the killer of Elizabeth Stride was attempting to avoid the police who were now on the lookout for him. Police Constable Watkins made the gruesome discovery about 1.45 in Mitre Square, about which he was later to say, I have been in the force for a long while, but I never saw such a sight. The body had been ripped open. 
After two murders in one night, the East End was in panic. It was shortly after that when two letters emerged, supposedly written in blood. One was to the Daily News and ended, Good luck, yours truly, Jack the Ripper. But did either of these letters really come from the murderer? Probably not. But real or not, they did nothing to calm the situation. On the morning of the 9th of November, 1888, the landlord of a woman by the name of Mary Kelly sent his assistant to make another attempt to collect her overdue rent. When he got to her room in Dorset Street, you know, the worst street in London, he found Mary Kelly was literally cut to pieces. The manner of the mutilations performed on some of the bodies led to speculation that the murderer had the skills of a physician or a butcher, a matter that was considered in the ongoing investigation. So, who done it? The investigation has been closed since 1892. No one was ever formally charged. So where does our suspect, Andrew Gibson or Walter Perot, fit into this horrendous story? Well, Gibson was known to London police as a forger and claimed he was related to the royal family. Small time deceptions, but indicative of the confidence he would have needed to carry out such vicious murders at a young age. But as well, he lived in Limehouse, just a couple of kilometres east down the A13. He can walk it easily in 20 minutes. And his family claim there are handwriting similarities between Perot and the so-called Ripper letters, and that he expressed a hatred of prostitutes, calling them the source of all disease. But the most salient factor of all, Gibson, later to assume numbers of aliases, including Walter Perot, set sail for Melbourne just hours after the last of the canonical five was murdered on the 9th of November, 1888. We know very little of Gibson's movements when he first arrived in Australia, except that he next appears as Dr Ernest Moore Chadwick, eminent Melbourne specialist in female nervous disorders. He was said to be very popular, but his practice didn't last long after an indiscretion with the patient was discovered by her husband and Gibson went north to Sydney. His next scam, which he would use for many years to follow, centred on forged documents that showed he would soon be the beneficiary of a number of English wills. He also took on a new name, Dr Henry Irving Llewellyn Cooper. While supposedly waiting for his ship to come in, he married a young heiress, moved to the harbourside suburb of Glebe and fathered two daughters. Naturally, the inheritances failed to arrive and the not-so-good Dr Cooper deserted his Sydney family and sought anonymity further north in Brisbane. But it was the same story again, this time as Surgeon Commander Percy Parker. He married an unsuspecting victim and on the proceeds of forged cheques, they sailed to the UK. The dastardly deeds continued. In Scotland, Parker deserted his third wife and fled to the United States with his next unsuspecting spouse, Ida Maud Campaign. As Sir Harry Westwood Cooper, he fleeced her of all she owned and after confessing to their landlady that he and Ida weren't married, he married the landlady and stole her savings as well. But things were about to get harder for Gibson. The police caught up with him in San Francisco in possession of a huge array of blank cheques and forging equipment. He was off to jail for three years. It wasn't to be his last term inside and what was becoming a downhill slide for the devious conman. When he wooed young, wealthy San Francisco woman Nora Schneider, proposing and buying her an expensive wedding dress and engagement ring, all on credit of course, he ran into the formidable figure of her mother who was not fooled by his promises of wealth. Mrs Schneider had her lawyer check him out. By the time she returned home, Gibson had eloped with Nora. He was caught, the marriage was annulled and he was sent to San Quentin Prison for 10 years. But the prospect of a decade behind the bricks and bars of a prison seemed only to inspire our villain. He secured the love of a missionary worker and married her. That was quickly annulled by her parents. Then Gibson forged a letter from a Superior Court judge ordering his own release. The jailer obeyed and despite the brilliance of the plan, Dr Chadwick, or Gibson, was recaptured and served his full 10 year sentence. He returned to Australia in 1912 and the marriages and scams continued until he was caught again. <laughs> 
Extradited, he spent the next 14 years in prison, seven of them in South Africa, where he was wanted for a number of offences. But his worst deed was yet to come. In 1940, now free again, and posing as a doctor from New South Wales, Harold Cecil Rutherford Darling, Gibson managed to get a job as a doctor in an English maternity home at Stoke-on-Trent. While on duty, he was forced with having to perform an emergency operation and the pregnant woman, his patient, died. Dr Darling, aka Andrew Gibson, was not released from jail until 1950 when he was nearly 80 years of age and he returned to Australia. Despite being entirely unqualified as a medical practitioner, he was appointed the medical superintendent of Safala Hospital. When he was sprung, the story goes that as the police came in the front door, he went out the back and made clean his escape by train. After one more appearance in Brisbane as a male nurse at the leper colony on Peel Island, Gibson, who had now assumed the name Walter Perot, 81 years old, came back to the mainland where he met and married 58-year-old Elizabeth Bessie O'Leary. They lived here in New Farm in Bessie's house. Perot spun his web of lies about funds coming from England, the proceeds of a will. That money would secure their future, he said, but when Perot died just a year later, Bessie's lawyers found there was no money and her savings were gone. The police were called in on the matter of where the money went and Walter was exposed as one of the nation's most notorious swindlers. Was he Jack the Ripper or one of Australia's worst con men? What Bessie really felt about her husband, in the end, we'll never know. But you get the feeling the family didn't hold him in high regard. The headstone on Bessie and Walter's grave sums it up. 